like to welcome you to the second program of the Wow Speaker Series. And uh, we all know him in different ways. Some of us as, co as the coach for soccer, some of us as history teacher. Uh, but we all, all come to appreciate him. And uh, please welcome uh, Mr. Paul Helcher. <laughs> Thanks for coming. When I got the invitation uh, in kind of a quiet, private setting with Paul and Zach, uh, I stopped and I reflected and I thought to myself, it's about freaking time, right? <laughs> I've been waiting all of these years to tell you people how I was going to fix the American economy. I was going to tell you what's wrong with the political system, right? After being passed over in the exact same month for not one but two coaching positions with the Rams, and the blues, I thought maybe my time had passed. <laughs> Still in shock three years later after not being appointed a position with the Obama administration, despite not one but two stickers on both of my Hondas, I thought maybe my time was gone. Obviously, I'm just kidding. The truth was I was excited about the opportunity to speak to you for about 12 minutes and then incredibly scared to death since that moment. What an honor. Wow. What in the world am I doing here? And I have to follow Ms. Rogers' beard and her dissertation on a thousand years of violence and the meaning of humanity. I mean, come on. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks to the students who put this together. Uh, it's especially touching with Zach and Paul, having them in a couple classes and befriending them, Abby and Sarah and some of the other people involved that I coach in soccer. It's a personal invitation from those people that, that make this uh, meaningful to me. Thanks to Dr. Lassos and Dr. Wilkinson for sponsoring this event. I hope that it becomes a wonderful tradition. And, and thanks to all of you, uh, parents, community members, anybody else that came. Uh, when I think about it, I guess your presence today says something. That you have nothing better to do on a Tuesday. <laughs> Well, that was supposed to go with the rant earlier, sorry, my timing's a little bit off. Travel! The more that I thought about it, the more I guess that I settled with this topic. I thought about doing something really out there. I was in the mood to be controversial, to push the envelope. Something that people would really remember, a date in infamy, something interesting. How New Gingrich would bring down the end of Western civilization. How Oprah ruined my love life. Why Albert Pujols should not sign with the St. Louis Cardinals. How Keanu Reeves ruined the movie industry. I thought of lots and lots of interesting topics, but the more I thought about it, the more I came back to my personal interest, and that's travel. As the date grew newer, as the great, as the date grew nearer, the more I became humbled by the honor of being here and nervous, given the open-ended nature of 30 minutes. What would I say? Last Friday, in talking with Paul Lister about our potential future project in Mexico, it was recommended by him to be personal. After talking to some students, some former students and soccer players on the internet, they suggested that I tell stories. While in class I feel like I probably talk more than enough, I remain a fairly private person. It's not easy to open up in a gathering of this size with this many people, many of which you don't know, and the added pressure of YouTube and alumni following on the internet. If I'm going to offer advice today, it's to be open. I guess if I'm going to offer that advice, I have to be open myself. If I'm going to put myself out there, then I have to start by putting myself out here. So here's my disclaimer. <laughs> Before I go on any further, let me say this. If I'm going to share a little bit of my life with you, I don't want to appear pompous. I don't want to appear proud. If I've been asked to share some words of wisdom, I have to honestly say that I don't know if I have any wisdom to share. I'll tell my stories and a few things that I've learned along the way that have been important to me, but I don't want to assume that somehow these are novel thoughts, or original ideas, or somehow I'm a person to be admired. After this session, my wife would like another 30 minutes with you in the lobby to discuss my very human nature. <laughs> my confusion with this thing she calls the laundry, my less than admirable trait of stacking dishes as high as humanly possible, and never touching the sink. The truth is that if I have this opportunity uh, to share just a little bit, I'd like to talk about what I've learned. I owe so much of my luck to her relentless support in giving me the opportunity to travel. When we got married, I immediately wanted to flee the country, teach and study abroad. She wanted to settle in 
buy the house and have kids. Oh. That's cute. If any of you have ever heard the word marriage, you know exactly where that debate ended. So our compromise when we got married was that we would have this wonderful family, but I would continue to be able to explore the world and try to learn as much as possible from I could, that I could from different people in different places. Which finally brings me to the theme of today's talk. Through grants and fellowships, endowed internships, and Fulbright scholarships, I have had the opportunity to travel in my lifetime, and I guess I would like to share some things that I've learned along the way. Maybe not too many things. <laughs> as much as the places that I've been, it's the decision-making process, or the lack of decision-making process, that I'd like to share. Let's all admit, once again, that I don't have any wisdom, except, of course, to suggest that we all have wisdom inside of ourselves. And our task is a matter of being ourselves, listening to ourselves and accepting our own inner guidance. Given the student population in attendance today, I'll start my story in high school. While I appreciate the adults in attendance, I think this, quite honestly, is my target audience. As a working class kid on scholarship at one of the local Jesuit prep schools, I saved my money about your age for the infamous senior spring break. At this time, roughly 20 years ago, the cool spot to break the law and act like a total moron was South Padre Island. Most of you are aware of the numerous rites of passages and other so-called social degradations that go with spring break, so I'll spare you my personal interest. I saved my money from a part-time job and a neighborhood lawn mowing business, and I was ready to go. And then there was an announcement. Perhaps this changed my life. I told absolutely no one, sorry, and I was just barely old enough to listen to something that people might call a conscience. There was a group of students going to Honduras with Father Chris Panay. As the president of the student government, I had helped raise some money in a mission week. To be honest, most of my supposed social awareness at that point in life included breaking the dress code, paying money to play video games in the lobby, and calling girls from area clad school academies to attend our mission league dance. My buddies were going to South Pottery Island for the party of a lifetime. My parents were not terribly excited about the idea, but of course, at 18, <clears throat> I was a grown man. <laughs> not paying my own bills, living in their house with their food, their insurance, etc. And then there was an announcement. I can remember that exact moment. How did I get so lucky to listen at that one moment to that one message? I don't believe in divine intervention, but I do think that we all have the inner wisdom to follow our heart, to block out the noise in our life and be peaceful inside of ourselves. I often think about that crossroads, and I suggest that all of you that we collectively have that same wisdom. But we deny it to ourselves. We deny ourselves that peace. We deny ourselves that quiet. We replace it with social expectations. The next car, the newest iPhone, the coolest boots. Tis the season to stop and reflect and listen to ourselves. I distanced myself from many of those spring break buddies in the past 20 years over that decision. I went to Honduras with kids that I had previously not talked to in four years of prep school. I met a Honduran child named Carlito, who died later during that trip. I ate in a village with people they named the Carib Indians. They were black as night. Not the Indians I had seen on TV. How did African Americans get to Honduras? Why were they so poor? Like many of you on similar mission-style trips, I had encountered something I was completely and totally unprepared for. Luckily, for another brief moment in time, I was open. I was open just enough to spend my money on a flight to, to, to Tegucigalpa instead of daiquiris on South Padre Island. It may have changed my life. <clears throat> if I have advice to give to anyone who hasn't yet fallen asleep, it's to be open. Listen to that voice inside of you and follow it. There is a huge world out there. Besides the cultural PC and the amazing expense of tourism, we can learn so much from the rest of the world. In the past century of American exceptional economic growth, we have somehow insulated ourselves from the rest of the world, and it is not good. When I listened to my own heart, it said that there was so much of the world that I had to see. Travel has forced me to keep an open heart and an open mind to new people, new ideas, and new ways of thinking. While I'm sure the same could be accomplished without leaving this auditorium, for me it was much easier to learn when I transported myself into completely new and uncomfortable environments. 
when I think of what, if anything, that I have ever, ever truly learned, when I think of the ambitious nature of providing words of wisdom to a well-educated community, I came to the conclusion that the only times that I really and truly learned about anything when I was alone, in distant places, with fear and adrenaline, when faced with a difficult choice in life, just like you, I've lied, I've denied, and I've tried to escape that truth that resides in each of us. I have gained more so-called wisdom in the mud huts of Tanzania, hutong alleys of China, and overcrowded subways of Tokyo than all of my formal education combined. If learning is growing, for me, growth has occurred when I have had the luxury of stepping out of the familiar and attempting to see the world from a totally different dimension. Today I'll talk about a few tough choices in which I was challenged to listen to myself, deny the extra societal baggage, and choose to find myself or to pretend to be someone else in popular wisdom. It is way too easy to become too comfortable in our own culture, in our own way of thinking, and yes, it is going to cost us. In many ways, it has already cost us. International awareness should not have to be linked to the almighty dollar, to the almighty dollar but how do we as a country not see the connection between our economic future and our international perspective? You've all seen the studies, and I'm not going to repeat the statistics. 50% of high school students can't find Iraq on a map. Two-thirds of adults don't know that China helped North Korea in the Cold War. Ignorance of the world, I guess, will have to wait for the next wow, t wow speaker. As I return to my trip to Honduras, Honduras forced me, sorry, to think of the world of slavery beyond the American colonies, the consideration of African people displaced by new environments, Marxist approaches to dependency theory, neo-colonialism, and ultimately elements of racism in our own society. For the remaining time of the talk today, I'd like, to share, I'd like to share with you a few things that have influenced me in this massive world. But again, I guess my message is this. Follow your heart. Be open to new experiences. See the world. Being open to yourself is kind of like being here up on stage, vulnerable, stumbling over your words. Often, we think we have the easy answers in an instant solution world of 24 news hour cycles. If we pretend at age 16 or 18 to have the answers, then what is the point of higher education? This takes me to the second turning point of my young life, the University of the Pine Hill Reservation. I didn't become a history major because I loved history from age five. I didn't have that favorite teacher that people like to quote. I studied history because when I was a business major, destined to make, to make lots of money and buy ties at, at other places than TJ Maxx, <laughs> I didn't go to class. As a business major, I'll be honest, I didn't do the homework. What's wrong with this picture? I'm living the dream as an undergraduate student at a good Midwestern university, and my grades absolutely stink for the first time in my life. I could not get motivated to go to class. <coughs> Finally listening to my inner voice after a couple unsuccessful semesters and reflecting over my grades, I realized that the tiny hint of the world that I had witnessed in Honduras gave me so many more questions than answers. And those questions got me out of bed in the morning and kept me up late at night reading books. If you've been in my classroom, you know that those questions still continue to haunt me, and I have not found the answer, even though I continue to read the books. With the fraternity of young men and women that I socialized with at what I friendly called J. Crew University, when you are over six feet tall, reasonably articulate, male, and a history major, you are destined for law school. And I was on my way. The rational thinkers in my family the news media, the advertising world, and the message for the broader society is obvious. History is an interesting hobby. You can travel to places during your break, but that's no way to actually make a living. As a side note, there was no way that I was ever going to think about teaching. Then, at a second major turning point in my life, like that announcement for Honduras, I went to a seminar about the Navajo Reservation. I was intrigued by the lack of Native Americans in American history. Somehow, and I honestly don't know how, I found myself at another one of those turning points. I could continue to law school and continue in a direction that society had deemed worthy, or I could take a bus several hours each week to Indiana University, about three hours away. It was a program called the American Indian Project. 
How was it that I had taken AP U.S. History, completed all of my required U.S. History classes on this wonderful continent, and I could say with a straight face that I didn't know anything about America before Columbus? I knew that I didn't want to be a teacher, but I was quickly turned on to a chance to go to the Navajo Reservation. Again, isolated from my friends and the well-accepted social life of college, that cheap bus trip to Indiana drove my consciousness in a very different direction. Some of my friends were traveling abroad, and I couldn't find that right scholarship. So maybe this was my cheap excuse to say to them and to say publicly and to say to myself, this was my chance to study abroad. But I knew that it was something very different. I had to play it off to them and to myself because I was struggling to admit my own intentions. I don't have words of wisdom today other than to reflect. A quiet moment and a suggestion to listen to that inner voice. I was accepted into this program and it gave students like myself the chance to work as undergraduates in a cultural anthropology on the Navajo Reservation. As a side option that I didn't tell anybody else, I didn't confess to anyone else, I also made up a lot of ineffective education classes along the way. Wow, real Indians. I went out to Rama, New Mexico in the summer prior to the teaching experience to live with the Navajo family fix up the school where I'd be working, and volunteer at sort of a halfway house for young men whose parents had gone through alcohol rehabilitation. I'll never forget driving up to that dorm that would be my home for six months. The picture looks something like this. First, a quick note on the driver and the car taking me up to this location for the next six months. I'm 21 years old. Indiana University, in all of their wisdom, placed undergraduates in pairs because the reservation and cultural immersion can be rather isolating experiences. In their wisdom, they made sure that each pair had one person with a car. The pairs had gotten to know each other during the training and were generally speaking good matches. Given the rural location, it's impossible to do something out in the middle of nowhere New Mexico without that transportation. Given the cultural and language boundaries, it was essential to have a university student with you at all times. I think you get it. Of course, if you know my luck, the person assigned with me driving a car on that day to Rama, New Mexico, left the reservation three days later. <laughs> Why were people in Honduras so poor? Why was alcohol such a vicious cycle on the reservation? How did I get here? For most of you in the crowd today, it will not be New Mexico. It will not be Honduras or Tanzania or Germany or China or Japan or wherever. But may I suggest that we all have that inner voice? that private conscience that suggests we know our own wisdom. Students, foster your voice. Find your rhythm. Follow your passion. For me, if you know where this story is going, it is the intersection between travel and teaching. Since coming to Clayton, I've taken a trip just about every summer to learn something about the distant world. For you, maybe it's a major or a new friendship or something that you haven't ever considered. But be open and listen to no one in this room, especially me. Listen to yourself. In current issues class this semester, with the recent passing of Steve Jobs, I found a YouTube clip that shows Jobs speaking to graduates at Stanford University. At the commencement, Jobs describes a calligraphy class that he took as a college student. At the time, he had no idea how this class would impact his life. He just felt passionate about seeing the script on paper. As we all know, computer fonts and Apple designs would never be the same if Jobs had not obeyed his own whimsical interests. Back to the reservation. Turning onto State Highway from Navajo Roads meant dust. And I honestly can tell you right now I remember the taste of dust in my mouth. After a few miles of dirt road, we arrived at the dorm. And the first thing that I saw in front of the dorm, outside a basketball court with no nets, Sean Kemp of the Seattle Supersonics, Magic Johnson of the LA Lakers, Reggie Miller of the Indiana Pacers. Well, sort of, not exactly. The four-foot-tall basketball players in NBA jerseys were middle school kids. Where were the real Indians? How did African Americans get to Honduras? Why was alcohol such a vicious cycle? Again, I was totally unprepared and totally at peace with that decision that changed my life. Going against the traditional experiences in college, I had stuck out my personal neck, and somehow it was the exact thing that I needed to do at the exact moment in time. I endured on the reservation weeks of early challenges. I was forced numerous times to reconsider my choices, but I knew I was doing the right thing. I was out there and very much alone. I was called Mr. Belagani by the students. 
If you don't mind looking up Belagani in your Navajo dictionary, it's sort of the equivalent of the N-word for white people. And the kids, for the first two or three weeks, would say every morning, good morning, Mr. Belagani, and then they'd chuckle, chuckle, chuckle. Not, of course, letting me in on the joke. After weeks of struggle, however, I did gain some acceptance. Eventually, I attended sweat lodge ceremonies that altered my entire sense of religion. I went to rodeo roundups that established my craving for fry bread. And in the end, I was presented with a small Navajo rug that hangs in my living room as a thank you from one family. Sheared from the family sheep woven by hand, I learned far more than what I taught anyone in my four classes. Teacher's note here, four preps times 90 minutes a day in a four block schedule. Sometimes we complain here, the reality is teaching in other places is very, very different than it is here. I taught American history to our first Americans. Government to a people who had a pretty legitimate gripe against the government. I taught geography and seventh grade Navajo history. I knew absolutely zero about Navajo history. I quickly learned the benefit of oral history projects as every grandparent within a 40 mile radius came into my class to tell stories. After finishing my teaching assignment on the reservation, I went back to Miami University in Ohio and completed my coursework. While I enjoyed the time on the reservation, I would never admit to anyone that I wanted to be a teacher. It was a secret inside of myself that I didn't think I ever really verbalized even to myself. The words of a parent of a woman I was dating at the time summarized the college crowd in my own family that when she said, don't waste your time being a teacher. I'm embarrassed now to say that my LSAT scores, when I look good, when I look back, look pretty good. It was clear to no one than myself that my heart was not headed to law school. Then there was another announcement. Not Father Panay at Dismet Jesuit School with a trip to Honduras. Not a seminar on Native American culture, but a suggestion of a rare acquaintance. Join the Peace Corps. Secretly, I knew right there in that instance. I can't remember what I ate for lunch today. If you know me well, you know that I can't find my keys or my phone. Literally, right now, I don't know where my phone is, but I remember that exact moment. If I could get to, come up with a crazy one, come up with something out there, gamble against yourself. If I could get to Africa. Why? I have no idea. I mean, I knew less about Africa than I knew about the Navajo before going to the Navajo Reservation. I had taken one class in anthropology and I had missed most of it. Something about the leakies and hominids and something along those lines. I said to myself, I know this is crazy, but if they can get me to see East Africa for some reason, I'm going. I somehow trusted fate. My fraternity friends and much of my family did not understand. Being open and following your inner voice is not easy on the people around you. My parents were generally supportive, but they never fully understood. When I called my mom, she said, Tasmania, great, I always wanted to visit Australia. <laughs> at 22, I left everyone I knew, and I taught at a school called Ziwani, in Swahili, that's next to the lake. The school is located in Mwanza, Tanzania, and I had the absolute time of my life. I'd like to return to that disclaimer. People sometimes suggest my time in Africa was some sort of sacrifice, or mission, or somehow I was going to save someone else. If this is the notion, then let me dispel it right now. You're missing the entire point. I went because my inner voice selfishly told me that I should be there, and this is where I wanted to go. Being open is being true to yourself. My wisdom is not anything inside of me to be handed out like Halloween candy or articulated in a 27-minute speech, but rather something that might now, that right now, might be inside of you. I hope I was able to help a couple kids on the Navajo Reservation through tough times. Or in Tanzania, I hope that maybe, in some ways, I showed fidelity with people in poverty. But honestly, I didn't do it to help others. I did it to learn, I did it to grow as a person. In a school with no running water and no electricity, in a town with no paved roads, in a country with 32 million people who are just a day or two away from starving, I found myself at home in a way that I never had before. I deferred on law school because I continued to deny my own destiny in the classroom. The assignment was Tanzania, of course, teaching history in a classroom. Teaching seventh grade Navajo history to Native Americans was a challenge. Teaching international economics to students in a country where there was no international trade 
where African socialism and the non-aligned movements and its connections to Mao Zedong were still part of the curriculum. Come on, what do I have to offer? Writing and reviewing this speech, I have lots of self-doubt. Is this the right topic? Am I being too serious? Not serious enough. Is this somehow a blatant attempt at self-promotion? I need feedback because I'm unsure of myself. Maybe I should have really talked about Albert Pujols. Every day I question what I do, what I do in the classroom and what I eat for breakfast. But here in this situation in East Africa, I didn't have a single moment of doubt. I honestly didn't care what other people thought. When you are open and follow your own inner self and allow yourself to speak to yourself, I believe we all experience a certain calm, a peace, a tranquility. My years spent in East Africa were amazing. I shared daily meals with my neighbors, the Wasakuma people, the ethnicity of that region of the country. I coached European football. I attempted to teach classes, but mostly I sat around and learned. I traveled to Victoria Falls in the Serengeti. In Cape Town, I was a witness to Mandela's South Africa and attended hearings for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that ended apartheid. I was temporarily held hostage at gunpoint in Mozambique and mugged in Nairobi twice on the exact same day. One summer, <laughs> one summer I worked in a refugee camp that resulted from the genocide in Rwanda, and I learned that there was so much more to learn. After September 11th, I've been able to tell my classroom of students that I lived in a Muslim country. I lived with Muslim people, and I was not only openly accepted, I loved every minute of it. I loved every minute of it. How did I get this lesson? Somehow, by accident, I ended up in my, deep, in my dream job at 24. I had it all. Of course, being part, part of being open and truly knowing yourself is also knowing that it doesn't always go exactly according to plan. While camping on the White Nile in Uganda in 1997, I know now what I didn't know then. I contracted schistosomiasis. You probably know this by its tropical pathogen name, Bilharzia, right? In stagnant pools of water, it enters your skin and it is fatal. People usually find out way too late. The diagnosis reached me via another friend who had the same symptoms. I was loving life even with the sickness he had returned home to the States and called. You need to get out. I was immediately put on a plane to London. Oh yeah, the whole thing. Hospitals in DC and London, the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta. My dream of staying and working in East Africa in an NGO or the U.S. Foreign Service would have to be put on hold, as my white blood cell count needed at least 12 months back in the United States. I literally had no money, and I ended up in the worst place of all, my parents' basement. <laughs> Vulnerable, the untouchable hero, inside of myself, was crushed. I was embarrassed, I was weak, and I had failed. What would I do now? All of my so-called plans. I had studied for international civil service exams. I was in the process of mastering Kiswahili. I was excited to travel throughout the world. I dreamed of an ambassadorship, organizing an NGO, and working in villages like Mwanza. After celebrating so much of myself, and being so proud of myself, and feeling like I had it all figured out, I had lost my inner voice. I had no idea. I struggled with self-doubt and a sense of betrayal. I judged the people around me. He eats too much. She doesn't understand the reality of the world. They, they spend too much. I was full of, of self-pity and criticism at everyone around me. And then, somehow, in the quiet of peace, two things happened. Finally, I admitted to myself that teaching maybe wasn't all that bad. Maybe just a year around the St. Louis area while I was getting better. I told everyone it was temporary, but I started to be honest with myself. Not to let the society's perception of certain jobs cloud the wonderful calling of education. I didn't find God, but I had relocated that inner voice. At the top of my game at 24, I had closed my mind to everything that had gotten me to that position. And I had to open my mind again to the ultimate truth that I belonged in a classroom. Oh yeah, and by the way, a high school girlfriend of mine had just moved back to St. Louis roughly the same time. Uh, that high school girlfriend is now my wife, and I think her and the kids are at the dentist office right now. <laughs> Perhaps sometimes being true to yourself also means staying home, or trying to blend the world of Africa 
with the contemporary classroom. When I finally admitted that I could be a teacher and abandoned the exotic dreams of faraway places, the peace returned and I had found myself. Please find your passions. It seems easy now, but for me it took so long to get over the fact that somehow I would be without millions of dollars. I'd be forced to shop for ties at places like TJ Maxx. I'd be without faraway ports of travel and into the American classroom. I hope that if you've had me as a teacher, you know that every day I'm excited about my job. I may not be very good, but I love what I'm doing. I still get to travel every summer, but somehow I found a home in the classroom, the last place where I was looking. Perhaps the destiny was, perhaps my destiny was being avoided. Perhaps you want to teach. Maybe you want to paint. Maybe you want to paint teachers or teach painting. I don't know. Don't let me, your parents or counselors, tell you what you should do with your life. When you get that sense of purpose, that sense of purpose will send you to class, get you up early in the morning, not for grades, not for image, not for a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, but for you. And when you have that sense of mission, there's nothing better. In the past 11 years here at Clayton, I've been lucky enough to continue to explore the world, to teach in the classroom during the school year and find my passion in the summer. Nearing the completion of this talk, and thanks for your patience in being here, I'll ask you to spend some time over the next two weeks listening to your inner voice. It may take a couple weeks, but when you get that moment of time, please attempt to find it. I've been very fortunate to find and lose mine several times. My fake wisdom here today is not your wisdom, but hopefully you can share with me the serenity and excitement that we all know that comes from following our passions. I've seen the craziness of Tokyo subways at all hours of the night. I've sat in Japanese classrooms and teachers have tried to explain the rape of Nanjing. In the Peace Park at Hiroshima, I promised that if I ever had kids, I would try to show them a different path of life. My second daughter's middle name now is Amani Swahili for Peace. Each summer in a new country, I gained a much greater appreciation about all of the other places that I know nothing about. My inner voice continues to propel me in all directions. While studying at Cambridge, I walked a bridge sketched by Sir Isaac Newton and sat next to a bench frequented by Charles Darwin. Despite my reservations about imperialism, I will never be able to deny the British contributions to science. While enjoying the worst kimchi you could ever possibly imagine in South Korea, I was forced about five years ago to make myself and my students more aware of the global technological revolution going on in the wireless city of Seoul. Just this past summer, I weeped at the drive to Dachau. While there is no way to simulate historical experiences, nor would we even want to begin to attempt to understand the complexity of such a location, Germany provided me with a very distinct sense of how the modern country of Germany deals with the emotional and psychological aftermath of the Holocaust. Without traveling to German soil, without walking the grounds and seeing it with my own eyes, I don't know if I would have gained the abstract balance of modern Germany today. With its Euro-saving and environmentally friendly economy and the proverbial historical reality hanging in the balance. When you read about China or see pictures on TV, it isn't the same as going to a city that you've absolutely never heard of that's larger than New York City. One day in Shanghai, I rode the fastest magnetic train, only to enter the quickest elevator in the world and summit at the exact same moment to the tallest hotel in the world. These are just examples. The world is moving fast. When I entered the classroom and settled for the supposed mundane life in American education, I did not abandon my dreams of world travel. Again, I was amazingly blessed with the luck to hear my inner voice and find ways to continue to feed my head and heart. As I finish today, I hope that you will also find your inner peace. I'd like to use this stage for one last moment to launch an initiative that I've been thinking about for my 11 years here at Clayton. As I mentioned before, Paul Lister and I have discussed a couple options, including one of them in Mexico. Perhaps drunk on the power of wow, I'd like to blatantly use this platform with a captive audience to try to extend my message and also challenge my own self to live up to noble thoughts. It's easy for adults to provide advice. Sometimes I have to take the irrational, bold move to move to put something on paper. <coughs> in this case, speak it out loud. To force myself to move abstract thoughts into reality. With two children in the elementary schools and selfishly thinking about their destiny, I'm hoping to develop a sister school project in Mexico. 
so that we as a claim community will have the opportunity on a yearly basis to visit places in the world very different than our own. Like my time in Honduras or New Mexico or Tanzania, I hope this project will allow students to find our callings in life. It is my dream that we will integrate this sister school project, its language, its history, and its culture into our foreign language and social studies curriculum. While the initial phase is currently underway or just inquiry and locations, it is my hope that this 15-year commitment will become part of our culture of Clayton, our service, and our international awareness. <laughs> Other than this idea of Mexico, I think we can all agree that I don't really have anything of significant substance to offer. I am admittedly just as lost as anyone else in this world. But I'll conclude with this. When I admit that I am lost, I find an inner voice and gain a personal peace. For me, these have been decisions around the world. For you, it could be something different. I encourage you to find that inner voice. Thank you.